You can call this the oversimplification of the century, and you probably will, but applied mathematics is about the business of approximation. It's about doing the best that we can with what we know to approximate something that we don't know. In our first application this semester, we're going to be looking at the process of facial recognition. And facial recognition is really about taking a whole bunch of faces that we know the names of, for example, the faces of all your Facebook friends, for example, who you or someone, probably they, have told Facebook exactly what name goes with what face. And then taking some unknown face, some new picture that you just uploaded from your camera, for example, and using an algorithm to figure out, given that unknown face, how close can we get to that unknown face from among the members of our set of known faces? So which known face is the closest approximation to the unknown face. That's what this is all about. So in class last time, we worked on an example, really basic toy example, of how do we find which point is closest to a given set. We saw one example where the set was a straight line, one example where the set was a parabola. There are some things that are common to both questions, some things that are different. But what we want to do is dwell on that question of closest. And where we begin with that is the topic of subspaces and projection onto subspaces. In this video, we're going to look at three things. First of all, we want to understand a little better the nature of the shortest distance problem. Are we always able to get as close as possible to a point outside of a set using points inside of a set? Secondly, we'll look at the linear algebra behind this. And linear algebra is where we're going to use most of our tools um, for the first half of this course when we work with finite dimensional problems. In linear algebra, we like to describe vector subspaces. These are things like lines, planes, linear subspaces. We like to describe them using a matrix, so we're just going to look back at how that works. How do we define a matrix whose column space is equal to a given linear subspace that we're trying to describe? And then finally, the really exciting part is how can we use the tools of linear algebra to project, in other words, to find that closest point on the set to a point outside the set? in a smart way, in an efficient way, in a way that gets around us having to solve some awful uh, nonlinear optimization problem using the tools of calculus. Um, also, hopefully, avoids us having to do a lot of fiddly geometry. How can linear algebra come to our rescue and give us, hopefully, we're going to work toward getting a matrix, the action of which is to project points outside of a subspace onto that subspace. So again, we have a set of known things for example, maybe the faces in our Facebook database. We have an unknown thing outside of that set. We want to find out which of the known things comes the closest to the unknown thing. And again, this is a shortest distance problem. From among all the points that are on this set of, of, of known things, um, the distances to the unknown are variable, right? Different points in the set of known faces, uh, for example, different to my Facebook friends, might be more or less uh, in resemblance to the image that I uploaded. But the person that I want is the one that gets this distance the shortest. So today is all about shortest distance problems. Well, what is the nature of the shortest distance problem? One way to formulate it mathematically is to say, given a set S and a point B which does not belong to that set, then can we find a point inside of S, inside of the set, which is the closest to B? And if we can find it, how do we find it? But like any good mathematical problem, we have to ask ourselves two really important questions. First of all, is it always possible to do this? Will a solution to this closest distance problem always exist? And secondly, if that solution does exist, is it going to be unique? Or could there possibly be more than one of these y's that achieves that shortest distance between the set S and the point B? So what we did last time in class is looked at two toy examples, an example of a straight line and an example of a parabola. So if the answer to both of these questions is yes, in other words, if a solution must exist and that solution is guaranteed to be unique, then there's only one such point y inside of the set S which gets us the closest to B. When that happens, we give y a special name. We call it the projection of B onto the set S. Thinking for the moment about the problem of projecting a point onto a line, let's think of the line y equals negative 2x, as we did in class, as well as the four labeled points. The question we had asked in class was, which of these four points is actually closest to the red line? One way to think about how to answer that question using Euclidean geometry might be to think about what are the set of all points which are a common distance away from one of these points look like. 
And of course, the tenets of Euclidean geometry tell us that such a locus of points is actually a circle. So for instance, if we think about drawing bigger and bigger circles around each of these four points, then the point which is closest to the line is going to be the one whose circle touches that line first. If we continue expanding these circles, we find out that the point whose circle touches the line first is right there. There's the first time that it happens at a distance of about 7.1 or so on the Euclidean plane. So the closest point to this line is this point right here, whose center is the center of the circle, which first touches the line at a distance of 7.1. All these other points, um, their circles with a radius of 7.1 don't quite make it to the line. So clearly the minimum distance between this point and this red line is actually 7.1. Also, Euclidean geometry tells us that because this red line is tangent to this circle, that means that if we were to draw a line from the center of this circle to this point right here where that circle touches a line, that that radius of a circle will have to be perpendicular to this red line because the red line is tangent to the circle. So this is a Euclidean geometric verification of something that we predicted in class, that the minimum distance will occur at a place where if we connect that point to the point which is off the line, we will get a segment which is perpendicular to the subspace that we're projecting onto. Let's hang on to that observation for later because we'd like to know if that happens in general as well. The question of which point is closest on a set S to a given point not in the set S becomes a little bit more complicated in this example. We looked at it a little bit in class. We start with a parabola. This is the one whose equation is y equals 1 quarter x squared. We start with a point in this example 0, 4, which is not a part of that parabola. And using the same logic that we just did, if we imagine drawing successively bigger and bigger circles, we're choosing circles because these are the sets of points which are a common distance away from our point 0, 4 in Euclidean geometry, then we're going to find the point which is closest as soon as this circle first touches the parabola. But what you'll notice is that that happens not just in one point, but actually in two different points. Once our distance gets up to about 3.4 or so, we can see there's a point right over here. I would say it's about, I don't know, negative 3 comma 2 or thereabouts. Um, and then another point over here on the other side of the axis, right about at 3 comma 2. Um, and both of those points are points of tangency between this parabola and this circle, which is the set of points, which is a common distance of, in this case, 3.4, away from our point off of the set. So if we're looking for the point which is closest to 0, 4 on this parabola, we don't just get one point. We actually end up with two points. So there must be something special about this parabola that causes non-uniqueness like this to happen. Or maybe a better way to say it is maybe there was something special about the line that we looked at previously which can guarantee for us that if there is a closest point, that that closest point is unique. Let's hold on to that observation as well for later. Now we can't, for example, say that there was a projection onto the parabola that we looked at in the previous example because the projection would be a non-unique object in that case. We had two different points, each of which achieved that shortest distance uh, to the point off of the parabola. So we want to restrict our attention to the extent that we can, and it is actually a very, it's still a very flexible thing to do, just to the examples where we have a linear subspace to work with, like the straight line from our original problem. So that's what we're going to do. The simplest case of finding projection is to let S be a linear subspace. Just as a reminder of what linear subspace means, a throwback to linear algebra. If we have a vector space, V, let's say it's a vector space over the real numbers, so that the real or the scalars that we work with, um, then that means that V is among other things, closed under the operation of addition of vectors and closed under the operation of scalar multiplication by vectors. And a subset S is called a linear subspace or a vector subspace if we're feeling fancy if it too is closed under those same operations that define the vector space V. In other words, it has to be closed under addition where the addition is the addition in the vector space V and closed under scalar multiplication where the scalar multiplication is the scalar multiplication of V. So here's a picture to kind of uh, illustrate what that means. If I have a vector space, let's call it V, and I'm drawing it as though it's R3, but it could be anything. And if I have a subset S inside of that vector space, then we're going to call S a linear subspace or a vector subspace. If any time I have a pair of vectors in S, their sum must also belong to S, 
We know the sum is going to belong to V for sure, because V is a vector space. But S is a subspace only if that sum belongs to S in particular. Likewise with the scalar multiples. If I have any vector inside of S, then any scalar multiple, we usually think of that in geometric terms as a, a stretch. We stretch it, but we keep it in a parallel fashion. That that scalar multiple must also belong to the set. So the picture in my own mind's eye whenever I think of a subspace is a plane sitting inside of three space. That's just my own mental model. Um, and one of the things that has to be true about that plane is it has to go through the origin. Uh, because S on its own right is a vector space, it also has to have a zero vector inside of it. Um, you can also prove that any vector subspace must have the zero vector inside of it. So that's my mental picture. But one of the real powerful things we're going to do this semester is use this same mental picture applied to a lot of really crazy different kinds of vector spaces, different kinds of subspaces. And that's where the real power of our techniques is going to come in. All right, so how does the linear algebra help us? I want to solve the equation in linear algebra ax equals b, where x is a vector in the domain of a linear transformation, b is a vector in the codomain, a is a matrix, or a linear transformation, going from the uh, domain to the codomain. We want to figure out which x gives us uh, b. And so what we're really doing, using the terminology of linear algebra, is figuring out whether b belongs to the column space of a. In other words, is there a linear combination of the columns of the matrix A, which give us the vector B. So just as an example, suppose I have the linear system x minus y equals 3, 2x minus 2y equals 6. You'll notice already that there's probably something fishy about this system, but let's just use it as an example. This linear system corresponds to a matrix equation, where a matrix we could choose is 1 minus 1, 2 minus 2. Matrix multiply that by the column vector xy, and on the right-hand side of the equation, we get the column vector 3, 6. So here, the role of x is being played by the vector whose entries are the variables x and y. b is the vector 3, 6. And a is the 2 by 2 matrix having those coefficients. Recall from linear algebra that what a matrix really does is it represents a linear transformation from a vector space, which is its domain, into a vector space, which is its codomain. In other words, a matrix is nothing more than a representation of a function. In our example, the matrix 1 minus 1, 2 minus 2, if I multiply that matrix by vectors x from the domain, which in this case is the xy plane, r2, what I end up with is vectors in the codomain, which in this case is also r2. So for example, 0, 0, if I multiply that by the matrix A, lands on 0, 0 in the codomain. But I can choose other vectors from my domain as well. And when those vectors are multiplied on the left by the matrix A, it produces a vector uh, which lies in the codomain over there on the right in the green. One thing you'll notice about this matrix right away is that even though I'm choosing a whole bunch of different vectors in different directions in the domain, all of my vectors in the codomain seem to lie in the same direction. And that's a, uh, just a reflection of the fact that this matrix has a range in the sense of functions, right? This is all of the vectors which are getting hit over here in the codomain. Its range is not all of R2. But in fact, it looks like its range just consists of the line that all these vectors lie on. If we put some labels in, what we can see is that that line, in this case is the line y equals 2x, that line is called the column space of A. Why is it the column space of A? Because it's made up of the span of the two columns that make up A. And these two columns, 1, 2, and negative 1, negative 2, happen to be parallel to one another. So not linearly independent, which means that their span, this column space, is a one-dimensional subspace of the codomain R2. The other thing that this makes possible is if we want to find a solution to the system that we just wrote down, in which case B, the vector we're trying to hit in the codomain, is 3, 6, we can do that. For example, a simple inspection can show us that the vector x, 3, 0 actually is a preimage of the vector 3, 6 in the codomain. In other words, the vector uh, 3, 0 multiplied by this matrix A on the left gives us 3, 6. But the fact that uh, the column space of this matrix is not all of R2 um, also implies that the solution of this is not going to be unique either. For instance, I can find other vectors, such as 2, negative 1, which also give me 3, 6 after I multiply them by A. And if there's two of them, then in true linear algebra fashion, there are infinitely many of them. I have actually a whole bunch of different vectors that lie along the solution set of ax equals b, which is an affine subspace which is parallel to the null space in the domain. 
recall that the null space of a matrix A is the set of all vectors which A sends to zero. And if A sends a vector to zero, like any vector which is in this null space that we have over here, if A sends a vector to zero, then that means that I can add one of those vectors to a solution and get another solution. Because after all, A is just going to kill any element of my vector which is in the direction of this null space. So I have a whole bunch of different solutions. Um, so I end up with a system which is consistent, right? We have solutions, 3, 0 is one of them, but my solutions are not unique because this matrix has a non-trivial null space.